The renowned adventurer Magellan, along with the fearless P. Feta, braved fierce storms and encountered mystifying giants in uncharted territories. Their voyage was filled with remarkable findings and deep emotions, unveiling ancient mysteries hidden in the past. They explored realms where history is blended with legends, witnessing wonders beyond imagination. Join us as we delve into the thrilling journeys that define their extraordinary expeditions around the globe. Magellan's Secret Trip to Discover the World This is the story of P. Feta from the Milan version, about his time with Magellan's world-first voyage, shared by Antonio Pita and translated by Lord Stanley of Alderley. Pita recounts his time with Magellan to the esteemed Lord Philip Devier L. Laden, the famous Grand Master of Rhodes. Many noble and curious lords are eager to hear about the astonishing things I witnessed and went through on my lengthy and risky trip and the paths I took. They won't truly understand until they hear it all from the beginning. Therefore, my lord, I'll start by saying that in 1519, I was in Spain, talking with the king and Ems Francis Chato, the Pope's envoy. Influenced by learned men and books about the sea's mysteries and perils, I set out, backed by the emperor and lords, to see these marvels firsthand. This was both to satisfy my and the lords' curiosity and to confirm my part in this expedition. Beginning my voyage, my lord, I heard about a fleet of five ships in the city aimed at finding the spice-rich Maluco Islands. The fleet was led by Fernando Magellan, a notable Portuguese figure. I embarked on this quest from Barcelona, sailing to Malaga, then journeying overland to Seville. I spent three months there until the fleet was prepared. After returning, my lord, I shared my findings with you in Montosa, where you greeted me kindly and asked about my experiences. To answer, I've compiled the main events in this brief account as well as I could. Before we set off, Captain General Magellan, wise and dignified, laid down key guidelines but kept the full voyage plan hidden to prevent crew desertion due to fear or the unexpected, given the sea's notorious storms and some captain's aversion to him. Perhaps because Magellan was Portuguese and most crew members were Spanish and these groups have long-standing tensions, but they still followed him. He established protocols to unite the fleet, especially during sudden storms, and issued written orders to each captain to strictly obey, barring major obstacles. Magellan chose to lead. At night, he'd signal with a torch or a fire bundle, a feral, to be visible to others. He sometimes used a lantern or a special burning reed, a trench for communication. Different lights indicated actions, two for slowing, three for partial sail retraction, and four for a full stop, then one to signify caution. He signaled hidden dangers like shallow waters or rocks with multiple lights or a cannon shot. He set sail signals, monitoring formations, and always hung a lantern at his ship's stern. Magellan divided night watches into three parts, early evening, midnight, and pre-dawn, rotating responsibilities among the crew. The team was divided among the captain, navigator, and chief officer. After these preparations, Magellan's diverse crew of 237 from various nations and five ships departed Seville on August 10th, St. Lawrence's Day, navigating the Guadalquivir River with only the main sail embarking on their grand adventure. While sailing down this river, we went past a place called Gone Deer Axe, busy with moors and a broken bridge to Seville, leaving just two underwater pillars. Navigating past them without hitting them requires local knowledge and high water. Past these, we got to Korea and past small villages until we reached St. Lucre, a castle by the Duke of Medina Sidonia. This spot has a port that opens to the sea, used with east winds to enter and west winds to leave. It's close to Cape St. Vincent at about 37 degrees north and 20 miles from the port, which itself is 35 to 40 miles from town. A few days later, our captain and other leaders arrived by boat. We stayed, gathering supplies and attending mass at Our Lady of Barra Church in St. Lucre. The captain made everyone confess and banned women from coming aboard for good reasons. On September 20th, we left St. Lucre, heading southwest, and reached Tenar Island in the Canaries 
on September 26th. After resupplying for three and a half days, we moved to Montos for more, like pitch for the ships. Interestingly, one Canary Island gets all its water from a cloud-catching tree at noon. On October 3rd, we sailed into the Atlantic past Cape Bird and other islands towards the Guinea or Ethiopia coast, around the Sierra Leone mountain at 8 degrees latitude. We faced odd weather, contrary winds, calm and rain, which is rare, for 60 days until hitting the equator. Near 14 degrees latitude, storms and currents made us lower sails and drift. Calmer seas brought large, scary sharks close, known for their big, dangerous teeth. At sea, we caught these sharks with a special iron hook. The larger they are, the worse they taste. Even small ones aren't good. In storms, we saw what seemed like St. Anselm's spirit, a fire-like light on our mast, lasting over two hours, giving us hope in fear. It's believed seeing this St. Anselm's light in a storm means the ship won't sink. After the light, the sea calmed, and we spotted unusual birds, some without tails, others where females lay eggs on the male's backs. There's also a bird that eats after others called Kago. We saw many flying fish, looking almost like an island. Crossing south of the equator, we lost the North Star, heading between south and southwest to reach Varan at 24.5 degrees south, near Cape St. Augustine. There, we found food like chicken, calf meat, and fruits like sweet potatoes and pineapples, which were very tasty, among other things I won't detail here to keep it brief. The locals traded a lot for simple items, five or six chickens for a knife or hook, two geese for a comb, a large amount of fish for a small mirror or scissors, and a basket full of sweet potatoes for a bell. They gave me five chickens for a deck of Italian playing cards, thinking they got the better deal. We arrived at this port on St. Lucy's Day, December 13th, right before Christmas. On that day, the sun was directly overhead, which we call the zenith in astrology. It's like an imaginary point straight above us, as explained in astronomy books. On this day, it felt as hot as when we were at the equator. Get ready, as we continue our trip into strange and wild lands. Our brave explorers step into the large and mysterious Varan, discovering new lands in Big Varan. The country of Varan is very rich and much bigger than France, Spain, and Italy combined. The King of Portugal owns it. Its people aren't Christians and worship nothing. They live simply, almost wild. They can live up to 100 or 140 years, walking around without clothes. They live in long houses called boy, and sleep in cotton hammocks called amash, hung across the room. They warm themselves with a fire placed under these hammocks. Each boy is home to about a hundred loud people. They have boats carved from a single tree called canoe, made without metal tools, but with stone tools. About 30 or 40 men can fit in one, using special paddles, and these men are usually dark-skinned and bald. The locals, both men and women, look healthy. They eat the meat of their enemies, not for taste, but tradition. This started when an old woman bit an enemy who killed her son. Now captives are not eaten whole, but piece by piece, dried and eaten daily to remember foes. A sailor, John Carvagio, confirmed this. They also paint themselves with fire and are hairless. Men wear no beards and dress in parrot feathers, covering only the backside. They pierce their lower lips, hanging small stones in them. They are not very dark, but more brown, and show their bodies openly. Their king is Cassock. They have many parrots, and they trade them for mirrors. They have small yellow monkeys and make round bread from tree marrow, which isn't tasty. They also have unique pigs and large spoon-beaked birds without tongues. They would trade their daughters for tools, but not their wives. The women here only spend time with their husbands at night. During the day, they handle outdoor tasks and carry food for their husbands in small baskets on their heads. Their husbands follow them, carrying a special kind of bow and arrows because they are very protective. They carry their babies in cotton slings around their necks. 
There are many more unique things here, but I won't go into all of them to keep it short. I will say, though, that the local people showed great respect during our Mass, kneeling and joining their hands. They quickly built a house for us, thinking we'd stay long. When we left, they gave us a lot of a dye called Varen from local trees. They thought we brought rain after a dry period, seeing us as heavenly beings, which made them open to Christianity. They also thought our small boats were the children of our big ships, which they found fascinating. A young woman once came aboard looking for something good. She found a nail, hid it in her hair, and left quietly, which amused us. For example, they call millet, millet, and a knife, anim pinda. We stayed 13 days in Varen. Moving on, we met cannibals and a giant man with a loud voice. Although they avoided us, we noted they moved very fast. We found seven small islands nearby, one rich in precious stones. This area, once called Cape of St. Mary, was thought to lead to another sea, but no ship has confirmed this. Here, large cannibals ate a Spanish captain and his men who trusted them too much. Later, we continued towards the South Pole, traveling by the coast, and found two islands full of geese, goslings, and sea lions. We couldn't count all the geese, there were so many that we quickly filled all our ships with them in an hour. These geese are black. All their feathers are the same size and shape. And they don't fly, but eat fish. They were so fat we didn't need to pluck them, just skin them. Their beaks look like those of crows. The sea lions here are different colors, big and round like calves, with small round ears and big teeth. They don't have legs just flippers that look a bit like hands with small nails and webbing. They can't walk on land, but are good swimmers and also eat fish. During our stay, a huge storm hit us, and we thought we were going to sink. But then we saw visions of three saints, and suddenly, the storm stopped. Then, moving to a place 49.5 degrees south, we spent the winter months at a port, seeing no one else. But unexpectedly, we spotted a giant dancing and singing by the sea, covering himself with sand. Our captain sent a man to mimic the giant's actions to show we were friendly. This worked, and they brought the giant to us. He was huge, twice the height of any of us, with a large red-painted face and yellow around his eyes, with two hearts on his cheeks. He wore a cleverly made animal skin. This animal seemed a mix of a mule, camel, deer, and horse, and there were many like it around. The giant wore shoes made from this animal's skin and carried a short, thick bow with arrows that had no metal tips, just stone. We treated the giant kindly, giving him food and gifts like a mirror and bells. Seeing his reflection, he was so shocked, he knocked some of our men over. When we returned him to shore, another giant saw him and ran to tell the others, who came back with him, all singing and pointing to the sky, showing us white powder they ate. We invited them to the ship, offering to help with their things. They came with their bows, and their wives followed, carrying their belongings like pack animals. Now, things get even more unusual, as our journey brings us face to face with towering giants. These giants challenge what we believe is possible, dealing with the dark giants eye to eye. The women were shorter than the men, but still very tall. We were all surprised to see them because they had long breasts and painted faces, dressed like the men but with a small piece of skin for cover. They brought four small animals, which they use for clothes, tied together like dogs. To catch these animals, they trick them by tying a young one to a bush. When the adults come to play with the young one, hidden giants shoot them with arrows. We brought back 18 of these giants, splitting them into groups for hunting. A few days later, our people met another giant, painted and dressed similarly, holding a bow and arrows. He made signs on his head and body, then did the same to our people, and raised his hands to the sky. The Captain General brought him on a boat to a nearby island where we kept supplies. This giant was friendlier, and enjoyed dancing and jumping so much that he made dents in the ground. He stayed with us for a while, and we named him John after baptizing him. He learned to say Jesus, Pater Noster, and Ave Maria clearly, though loudly. We gave him clothes and other gifts before sending him back. He left happy, but never returned, 
and we feared the other giants might have harmed him. Later, we met four more giants without arrows. They had hidden them, showing us where. The captain kept two younger ones, planning to take them to Spain. He tricked them with gifts, then put shackles on them. At first, they liked the shackles, not knowing their use, but became angry when they realized they were trapped. They screamed and raged like bulls when they saw they'd been deceived. This means they called on a powerful evil spirit for help. It was hard to tie up the other two giants' hands, but we did it. Then the captain sent them and nine of our men back to land to fetch the wife of one giant who was missing her. But one giant got free and ran away so fast we couldn't see him anymore. He didn't find his friends or the women at first because they were out hunting. But he found them later and told them everything. The other giant tried hard to get free. One of our men hit him when he tried to escape, making him very angry. Still, he showed our people where the women were. That night, John Kagio, the man in charge, decided not to bring back the giant's wife, but to stay there since it was almost dark. The freed giant came back with another giant. They saw their friend with a head injury but said nothing until the next morning. Then they talked to the women and they all ran away fast, leaving everything behind. From a distance, two giants shot arrows at our men. One man was hit in the thigh and died right away. The giants ran off when they saw he died. Our men had crossbows and guns but couldn't hit the moving giants. Afterward, they buried our man and burned the giants' left-behind items. These giants run faster than horses and really care about their wives. When they have stomach pain, they don't take medicine but swallow a long arrow to throw up green bile and blood. They vomit because they sometimes eat thistles. When they have headaches, they cut their foreheads, arms, and legs to let out blood, thinking it removes pain from those areas. They cut their hair short and wear a cotton cord around their heads to hold arrows when hunting. When one dies, they believe ten or twelve devils dance around, with one bigger, noisier devil leading them. They paint their bodies like these devils. The biggest devil is called Saus, and the other's Chelul. They also told us they saw devils with two horns, long hair, and breathing fire. They call these people Pagum. They live in tents like nomads, eat raw meat, and a sweet root called Kapak. The two giants we had on the ship could eat a whole basket of biscuits and rats without removing their skins, and they drank a lot of water each time. We stayed in St. Julian's Port for five months. During this time, odd things happened. One odd thing was that right after we got there, the leaders of the other ships tried to kill our main captain. Their names were John of Karagin, El de Mendoza, the treasurer, and Anthony Coca. We found out about their plan, so Mendoza was killed with a dagger and cut up. Gaspar de Sita was beheaded and then quartered. Anthony Coca tried to betray us again later, so he was left in Patagonia, but not killed because Emperor Charles had given him a high rank. Our ship, St. James, was lost while exploring the coast, but all the crew survived miraculously without getting wet. Two survivors came to us and told us everything. The captain immediately sent people with food for them for two months. We kept finding stuff from the lost ship and its crew. The place where the survivors were was far, and the journey was hard, taking four days through thorns and without water, only ice. In St. Julian's port, we found long capers called Mygon, with pearls inside, and also incense, ostriches, foxes, sparrows, and tiny rabbits. We placed a big cross on the highest mountain to show it was Spain's land, naming it Mount of Christ. Leaving there, we found fresh water at latitude 51 degrees south, staying for two months. This place had fresh water and strange, scaly fish, our adventure grows even more intense with dangerous seas and fights among the crew. We must stick together to find our way through unknown waters. Rough sailing through snowy peaks. Before leaving, the captain wanted everyone to confess and take communion as good Christians. Then, on October 21st, the day of the 11,000 virgins, we found a strait at 50 Sioux degrees south, which we called the Cape of the 11,000 Virgins. This strait was long and led to the Pacific Sea. It was surrounded by tall, snowy mountains and was so deep we couldn't anchor normally. 
we had to tie the ships to the land because the water was too deep. Many sailors thought we were trapped, but the captain believed there was another way out, claiming he had seen it on a map from the King of Portugal, made by a famous navigator, Martin of Bohemia. He sent two ships, St. Anthony and Conception, to find the exit while our ships, Trinitat and Victory, waited in the bay. We faced a big storm that night, forcing us to lift anchor and let the ships drift in the bay. The other two ships faced such strong winds they couldn't get around a point at the bay's end. Trying to reach us, they nearly crashed onto the shore, but as they neared the bay's edge, expecting the worst, they spotted a tiny opening they mistook for a corner and, in desperation, sailed into it, accidentally finding a passage. Realizing it wasn't a corner but a passage, they moved on and discovered a bay, then another passage and a bigger bay, making them very happy. They rushed back to report to the lead captain. We feared they were lost due to the fierce storm and not seeing them for two days. But then, we saw them approach, celebrating with loud cannon fire, which we returned. We all gave thanks and continued exploring. Inside the strait, we found it split into two paths, one going southeast and the other southwest. The lead captain sent the St. Anthony and Conception ships to check the southeastern path for a passage to the peaceful sea. The St. Anthony, impatient and wishing to return to Spain, left without the other. The ship's pilot, upset with the lead captain for personal reasons, led a mutiny, capturing the captain, who was the lead's brother, and returned to Spain with him and a giant we had captured, who later died from the heat. The Conception, left behind, searched aimlessly. The lead captain and another ship then explored the southwestern path, discovering another strait and a river full of sardines, where we waited four days for the others. We later sent a boat to explore further. They returned, having found a vast sea, which delighted the lead captain, who named it Cape of Desire. Returning, we found only the Conception. Its captain, John Sano, said he hadn't seen the other ship since it sailed into the southeastern path. We searched the whole strait, and the lead captain sent the victory ship to the entrance to look for the missing ship, instructing its crew to leave a sign if they found nothing. So, the idea was to help the lost ship find its way back by spotting the flag and reading the letter that explained where the captain had gone. This plan was set from the start to reunite any separated ships. The crew did as instructed, placing not just one, but two flags with letters at different locations. One on a hill in the first bay, and another on a small island in the third bay, where many seals and big birds were. The lead captain, near a river called Isles, placed a cross on an islet by the snowy mountains. This river joined the sea close to the Sardine River. If we hadn't discovered this passage, the captain was ready to sail towards the South Pole up to the 75 degrees latitude, where summers have almost no night and winters almost no day. Indeed, in this strait, nights lasted only three hours in October. The land along the strait on the left towards the Soko wind, was named Pathon. Every short distance, we found safe harbors, fresh water, woods, fish like sardines, and a sweet herb called celery, alongside a bitter variety. This place seemed like the most beautiful and perfect strait on Earth. The sea life here was fascinating, especially three large fish types, dads, albors, and bonitos, chasing flying fish named Kolar. When the flying fish escape into the air, they glide over the water, but the big fish follow, waiting to catch them as they fall back, a sight both strange and delightful. Regarding the language notes, they reflect the words from the giant of Patagonia, showing a blend of different languages, indicating the text wasn't just translated. These were throaty words shared with me by the giant we had on board who, seeking understanding, asked for bread and water in his tongue. When I showed him the cross, he initially reacted with fear, but later, when sick, he embraced it, showing a desire to convert to Christianity, and we named him Paul. Make a fire, these people rub a sharp stick on another, until it sparks and lights the dry inner part of a tree they put between the sticks.
In the Milan edition, Book 2 starts. On Wednesday, 28 the November 1520, we left the strait and entered the Pacific Ocean. We were at sea for three months and twenty days without fresh food or water. We ate old, powdery biscuits filled with bugs and dirt from rats. We drank yellow, bad-smelling water. We also ate leather from the ship's equipment, left in the sea for days then barely heated, because it was tough from weather exposure. We even ate sawdust and rats, though rats were expensive and hard to find. The worst was when our crew's gums grew so much they couldn't eat. Many got sick. Nineteen died along with a giant native. Despite the sickness, I stayed healthy. We sailed 4,000 leagues in the calm Pacific, named for its stillness. We saw no storms, only two empty islands with just birds and trees, which we called the Unfortunate Islands. They were 200 leagues apart, with no place to drop anchor. We saw many sharks, big fish called Tiburon. We depended on the wind and prayed to the Lord and Mother Mary for good weather and provisions. Without their help, we'd have starved in the vast sea. This shows they hold Mother Mary in high regard, above Jesus, which they see as right. With new lands and secrets waiting to be discovered, let's find out what the vast Pacific holds, the islands of theft and friendship. Exiting the strait, we kept to the west, avoiding all land except two capes at the strait's ends. These capes are both at 52 degrees south latitude. The southern sky is different, with fewer bright stars, just two dim clusters. At sea, we noticed our compass was less effective. In the middle of the sea, we saw a bright cross of five stars to the west. We sailed various directions until reaching the Quinole line, far from the known dividing line. We passed two rich islands, Shanggu and Supra, at different latitudes. After crossing the equator, we sailed west and northwest, then turned southwest after 200 leagues until we reached 13 degrees north latitude. This brought us near Cape Gakara, which despite what mapmakers say is actually around 12 degrees north. We then sailed 60 leagues to 12 degrees north and 146 degrees longitude. On March 6th, we spotted a small island northwest and two more southwest. The biggest island seemed a good place to find food, but when we tried to land, the locals swarmed our ships, stealing whatever they could. As we tried to land, they even stole a small boat tied to our ship. In retaliation, the captain led 40 men to burn houses and boats on the island, killing seven people and retrieving our boat. After this, we left quickly. Some of our sick crewmen asked for the organs of any locals we might kill, believing it would heal them. Interestingly, when locals were hit by our arrows, they would pull them out, look surprised, and then die. As we sailed away, they followed us for a bit, offering fish, but also throwing stones before fleeing. These islanders live freely, without leaders, wearing nothing but hats made from palm leaves. They start life white, but turn brown, with black and red teeth. The women cover themselves with thin bark and don't work outside, focusing on making cloth and baskets. They eat fruits, birds and flying fish and use coconut or sesame oil on their hair and bodies. They use simple weapons and are known for their thievery, which is why we named the area the Ladrone, Thief, Islands. Their main activity is fishing with flying fish, using unique, narrow boats that move fast and are painted in different colors. They seem to believe they are the only people in the world. On Saturday, March 16, 1521, we spotted a tall Iceland at Down, 300 leagues away from the last Iceland we called Thieves' Iceland. We named this new island Zamal. The next day, our leader decided to land on a nearby empty island for better safety and to collect water. We also took a break there for a few days, setting up tents for those who were sick and providing them with slaughtered S. On Monday, March 18, after lunch, we noticed a boat heading our way with nine men. Our leader instructed everyone to stay calm and quiet until he said otherwise. When these people reached our island, their leader approached our captain, showing happiness to see us. Five of them stayed with us while the rest went back to call others who were fishing. Soon, they all regrouped with us. Seeing these islanders were friendly, our captain offered them food and drinks, 
and gifted them red hats, mirrors, combs, bells, ivory, and more. In return, they gave us fish and a jar of their palm wine, known as uraka, along with long figs, superior-tasting smaller ones, and two coups. They indicated that in four days they would bring more supplies, like rice, cocos, and other foods, as they headed toward warmer islands like Hawaii. The fruit mentioned, kuchi, comes from palm trees, similar to how we get bread, wine, oil, and vinegar from various sources. They make a special wine from palm trees by boring a hole at the top to tap a sweet but slightly bitter liquid, which they collect in large canes overnight. This is their version of wine. This palm tree grows a fruit called kocho, about the size of a head. Its outer layer is green and very thick. Inside, there are strong fibers used to tie their boats. Beneath this layer is a hard shell, harder than that of a walnut. They burn this shell to make a useful powder. Inside the shell, there's a white core as thick as a finger, eaten fresh with meat or fish, tasting like almonds. It can be dried to make bread. In the core, there's sweet water that turns solid like an apple after settling. To make oil, they let the coconut rot, mix the soft core with water, then boil it to make a butter-like oil. For vinegar, they spoil the coconut water and expose it to the sun until it turns sour like white wine. They can also make a milk-like liquid by mixing and straining the core with its water. This palm is similar to a date palm and can support a family of ten. They rotate tapping two trees to keep them healthy for hundred years. We became friends with the local people who taught us their language and the names of nearby islands. They lived on Zulum, a small island. Our captain treated them with respect, showing them our goods and firing cannons, which scared them. They recognized some of our spices as local. When leaving, they were polite and promised to return. We named our landing spot Hunu, but renamed it the Watering Place of Good Signs due to its fresh water springs and the first signs of gold. There was also white coral, small fruit-bearing trees, and many palm trees. The surrounding area, rich in islands, was named the Archipelago of St. Lazarus as we arrived on that feast day. This region lies at 10 degrees north latitude and 161 degrees longitude from the demarcation line. Was Magellan's encounter with the Antarctic giants just a tall tale, or did these colossal beings truly walk the earth? Share your thoughts and theories below, and don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more.